Memphis, Tennessee, today a thriving city on the Mississippi River. But did you know that because of a little insect, this bustling metropolis was once laid so low that its population was cut by nearly 69% and actually ceased to legally exist for 13 years. So how did one of the world's smallest bugs nearly destroy a great American city? That's the city's secret. All cities have their secrets. Whether buried in the forgotten sands of time or cemented into the foundations of the modern metropolis, every community has a hidden history, a contributing factor to its rise or fall. It's not obvious to the casual or even critical observer, concealed in architecture, monuments, or street names. But it's always there, the human factor which helps sustain a society. Alas, fair Memphis, what sights meet the eye of those who remain in thy midst? At every turn and corner, a cry of distress is wafted on the breeze that floats o'er housetops through your streets and alleys. On every side is met with the bowed form of some citizen who has lost a relative or friend. Dr. J.P. Drumgul. To the denizens of Memphis, Tennessee, the yellow fever epidemic of 1878 must have seemed like the end of the world. To those critical of the city's corrupt politics, it was divine retribution. Safely viewing the conflagration from the cooler climes of the north, some glib newspaper editors even went so far as to use the outbreak as an excuse to burn Memphis to the ground before the dreaded Yellow Jack could take hold anywhere else and forever make it a hot zone. At the worst of the epidemic, 200 people were dying per day. Uh, you could take a city of Memphis size today. If 200 people died per day, say for three or four weeks, it would be terrifying. It would strain even our sophisticated medical facilities today. It's been cited as one of the very worst catastrophes in American urban history, leaving 20,000 dead throughout the South, completely disrupting commerce and very nearly destroying Memphis itself. But like fellow river resident Mark Twain, all predictions of Memphis's demise were premature. The Bluff City would survive, the disaster ultimately bringing out the best and occasionally worst in its character. Uh, among the first to escape were uh, the political leaders of the city. Uh, they knew it was happening. They uh, led the flight from the city. One group that kind of strikes me as being really heroic are those sisters from St. Mary's, from the cathedral, because two of them were actually out of the city on vacation, and they came back to Memphis. And then others came into the city during the epidemic. And they are caring for the, the sick, they're taking care of the children, the orphans. Um, they're doing all these things. Annie Cook is a very different heroine. She was a madam who had a house uh, on Front Street. But she came to the fore, too, to assist with yellow fever victims. She turned her house into a hospital and took in uh, victims of yellow fever. Uh, organized her girls to serve as nurses, and Annie, along with several others, uh, died as a result. Up until this time, Fortune had mostly smiled on Memphis. Founded in 1819 as a commercial outpost atop the bluffs bordering the eastern bank of the Mississippi River, it was a rough and tumble frontier town in the hinterland between New Orleans and St. Louis, a place where fortunes could be made in the thriving trade of cotton. Blessed with acres of alluvial soil, the surrounding land was fertile, trade was brisk, and after the arrival of the railroads, this brawling burg quickly grew into a cosmopolitan city. By the 1850s, Memphis population growth was more than 150%. From nearly 9,000 people at the beginning of the decade to 22,000 at its end. Even as the Civil War swept westward in 1862, fate was still kind when a brief but pitched naval battle on the Mississippi River assured that the city and its transportation network would be captured intact by Union forces. 
By the end of the war, most southern cities lay smoldering, while Memphis was in an ideal position to fully renew its commercial ties to the area. Now, the city's rapid growth had resulted in severe health problems. For one thing, the location of Memphis in uh, the Great Mississippi River Valley, low-lying location surrounded by swamps, creeks, and rivers meant a great deal of water and enormous numbers of mosquitoes, which were uh, an annoyance but not known to be a health hazard at that time. Furthermore, the city had no sewer system. Uh, sewage was collected in privy pits uh, at individual homes and uh, was thrown into the streets and alleys. Dead animals were disposed of in the same way. And by the time you get to the mid-1870s, uh, most of the street cleaning crews had been laid off. The only uh, garbage collection really was done by wandering uh, droves of pigs. It was as if the circus had come to town. Memphians sat back to enjoy the wealth and power which now flowed into the city. Victorian manners began popping up along Adams Street, a solid facade of affluence which removed the elite from the hurly-burly traffic and repugnant smell of downtown. And just like this hand-carved display at Memphis Pink Palace Museum, the town became entranced with the grand spectacle of its rapid growth. With a population now hovering around 56,000, Memphis was beginning to challenge New Orleans and St. Louis in mastery of the Mississippi. Behind the parade of wealth, however, lurked a civil government which was corrupt, exploitative, and outright negligent in its obligations to the community. So much so that Memphis still resembled a frontier town in its rampant gambling, lawlessness, and murder. Taxes were so often diverted for bribes that infrastructure and public health were ignored. The circus was here to stay. Memphis politicians had been known for dishonesty, but in the decade of the um, 1870s, it was particularly bad. A great deal of money was spent and stolen, and the tax rate increased several hundred percent. The city was not only uh, out of money, but was seriously in debt. The city had to uh, fire the street cleaners, uh, who would normally have done a certain amount of sanitation work in the city, did not have enough money to pay policemen and teachers, was in serious financial trouble. And it was an extremely unhealthy place with the highest death rate of any city in America at that time. Such mismanagement so angered Memphians, many simply refused to pay their taxes, leaving the city even more strapped for cash. Some of the more responsible citizens even tried to rein in the situation by lobbying to get the city's charter revoked. Primed for disaster, Memphis had a preview of things to come in 1873, when two sick riverboat passengers from New Orleans disembarked. More than 5,000 residents became infected with yellow fever, killing 1,700, Memphis's worst outbreak thus far. Hundreds of citizens fled before the scourge, including most of the city council, leaving the city even more vulnerable than it had been during the Civil War. Nothing could be done to stop it until the first frost of fall, their sole salvation. The disease goes very rapidly and the person becomes very ill with high fever and and chills. Excruciating pain, back and head pains. Some people did acquire yellow color, hence the name yellow fever. This uh, disease incidentally was known in uh, some tropical locations as um, vomito negro or black vomit because um, a following stage involved a great deal of violent vomiting and um, of uh, black vomit uh, too, which of course was from uh, severe internal bleeding and the deterioration of internal tissues. Then there seems to be a, what appears to be a recovery period. And if the individual gets up and tries to resume normal activity, there'll be a setback and usually the person will become seriously ill. 
and die within a few days. By 1878, it was understood that yellow fever was a virus. And should you be fortunate enough to survive its ravages, you'd have some immunity. Cities in tropical areas were periodically infected, particularly New Orleans. But the virus tended to be much more mild in children, creating populations that could weather future outbreaks. What still wasn't understood was exactly how the disease was transmitted as it moved irresistibly inland along transportation routes into communities like Memphis, where outbreaks were occurring with increased frequency. And with the end of the federal blockade of southern ports, renewed trade was bringing the deadly virus back to these shores with fresh ferocity. In Memphis, a whole new generation had been born and raised since the Civil War, who were not immune as well as great influxes of German and Irish immigrants who had never even been exposed. Compounding the situation in 1878 was a newer, far more virulent strain developing in the tropical jungles of the West Indies. As rumors spread north of its devastating effects upon even those with immunity, Memphis steeled itself for the worst. As this new strain began hopscotching its way up from the Caribbean, New Orleans, as usual, was hit first, then towns in Mississippi. Feeling altruistic, Memphis sent relief supplies south to these beleaguered burgs, confident that it had taken all the appropriate measures to protect itself. There seems no possibility of the fevers reaching Memphis this year, assured the Memphis Board of Health. Steamboats and trains traveling north were stopped outside town at checkpoints and examined for anyone looking even mildly sick. With shotguns or cannon clearly in view, those unfortunate enough to be under suspicion were escorted to the city hospital or a quarantine facility on President's Island. However, even as the hogs and cattle which normally had run of the city streets were being rounded up, the last of the city's tiny contingency fund was used up to hire more workers to clean up the rotting refuse in the downtown area. But this was August the 1st, and by then it was too late. It is entirely possible that the fever had already taken root in the city as early as July the 21st. Medicine just did not have the tools and the knowledge to make concrete diagnosis. City political leaders prior to 1878 had generally tried to cover up a yellow fever outbreak when one occurred, mainly because they thought it was bad for business. People would be frightened and people would leave, and people would not come to Memphis to spend money, all of which was true. On August the 5th, Mrs. Kate Bionda became the first officially reported yellow fever casualty. She operated a food stand down by the river where, unbeknownst to the authorities, skiffmen from Arkansas had been breaking the quarantine at night for two weeks. Throughout the years, various ideas were proposed to explain yellow fever's inexplicable contagion pattern, ranging from pure superstition to hard science, from poisoned soil to noxious effluvia. Germ theory had lately come into vogue but physicians and researchers still struggled to rationalize the seemingly random way yellow fever was disseminated. For while Kate Bionda lay dying in her riverfront shack, a policeman living several blocks away also passed away from the fever, with no discernible connection between the two. Some doctors felt that it was contagious, moving between human being to human being, other doctors felt that it was attributable to poor sanitation, rotting, stagnant garbage, and, and things of that sort. The prevalent theory in 1878 was that fomites, a word you won't find in many 20th century dictionaries, were spreading the disease. Objects like mail or merchandise thought to have absorbed microscopic seeds or spores from the sick. However, the truth was literally buzzing under their noses. We would certainly point out that the disease originated um, in West Africa. 
It is considered to be a new disease probably of the 17th century. Uh, the host for that disease is the, are monkeys of tropical areas. Slaves were brought into the Caribbean and into the southern United States uh, in the slave ships. Um, so many of the uh, African slaves were infected with the disease. Or even if the slaves themselves did not have the disease, they brought infected mosquitoes. The Edes aegypti breeds generally in clean water, looking for things that would have been very prevalent in the uh, 19th century. Despite efforts to keep it quiet, by August the 13th, the nature of Beyonda's death was out as the city sealed off the whole block of Adams and Front, burned the contents of the woman's store, and sprinkled the entire site with a mixture of kerosene and carbolic acid. But by the very next day, 19 more people were diagnosed with yellow fever, with three more deaths. The dreaded plague had begun, and the city's reaction was almost immediate. Great crowds of refugees fled from the city. They uh, crowded the waterfront, taking a passage on every available boat, filled the trains, uh, filled the roads and streets getting out. In just five days, over 34,000 people, more than half the populace, had fled the city by rail or steamboat to points north and east, while those jamming the roads and wagons or on foot settled into the countryside or into refugee camps. Of the remaining 22,000, nearly the entire African-American community of 17,000 stayed behind, along with about 5,000 whites. An overwhelming majority of the people who are left in Memphis are African-Americans, and there are several reasons for this. Um, I think one of the major reasons is that to leave, you have to have some resources to leave, and most of them have no resources because they're a poor working-class population. And the other is that I think those who were here who had resources may have felt that they needed to stay and protect them. Those fleeing the city encountered their own purgatory as other towns and cities fearfully began shutting the refugees out. Vigilance, activity, fearlessness, and the double-barrel shotgun will give a community entire immunity from yellow fever. A Mississippi official had bluntly stated earlier, of the Memphis elected government, only the mayor and the Shelby County Sheriff remained at their posts. Not much in the way of help was coming from the outside. In the lazy fare philosophy of 19th century America, government agencies rarely stepped in. Private individuals or organizations were expected to assist. In the political vacuum left by the exodus, two such groups performed this role. The newly formed Citizens Relief Committee took over civic duties, while the philanthropic Howard Association helped provide medical care. The Howard Nursing Society and the Howard Medical Society sent doctors and nurses into the homes to try to care for the people who were sick. The role that they usually give for African Americans during this period is, of course, nursing or caring for the sick that they are the ones who are still here, so obviously they're going to be the ones who are called upon to help with the nursing. Um, there are others who stay and who form the police force or who help out in terms of policing the city. Um, there are black militia units. There was a black militia unit that provided some of the police help or police force during this period. Many of them, it seems to me, did turn to religion. Many of them uh, supported one another tried to bury the dead, comfort the ill, uh, protect the living. I think that's the motivation you get in why the Memphis Police Department uh, in such numbers stayed. But the city was mostly empty. Uh, there was so much space. You cannot imagine the desolation in the city. For squares, you will see only a family now and then. So many are gone that lonesomeness itself is lonely making a gloom that cannot be conceived of. Dr. William Armstrong, Maury County, Tennessee. The newspapers were rife with horrifying accounts of forlorn deaths. With a bit of dramatic license, 
Stories such as this one, detailing a doctor's visit to a victim's farmhouse, painted a grim picture of the more unfortunate. The place was in a state of disorder and was filthy. An abominable stench pervaded it, and the three ground floor rooms were smeared all over with black vomit and other inutterable excreta of the wretched victim. Eventually found dying alone behind a stove, his own flesh and blood forsook him and fled. John Keating, editor, The Memphis Appeal. The doctors, the nurses, and the other workers, many of them, uh, had one characteristic. Uh, they, uh, they smoked cigars, both men and women, uh, steadily throughout the day. They, uh, they did that partly because of the uh, terrible smell of the city. Uh, with all the death and the uncollected sewage, but it may have had a bit of effect uh, in keeping mosquitoes away from them. August stretched agonizingly into a balmy September, and with 200 people dying each day, every system in the city was overtaxed, particularly the burial detail. Bodies were piling up everywhere, with health care officials worrying that the decaying corpses would contribute to the infectious conflagration. At one point, the committee even issued an arrest warrant for the county's undertaker when it was discovered he was stockpiling bodies in his stable on Union Street until he had full enough loads to send to places like Elmwood Cemetery. Eluding capture, the committee eventually turned his task over to the police department. Death total began increasing, and people died in such numbers that uh, a great problem developed with the inability to uh, carry out burials rapidly enough. Uh, many people feared being around the uh, corpses of uh, victims of the yellow fever, and the city uh, did collect money, did pay people to operate dead wagons, carts that would uh, go through the city to the streets, to homes uh, where people had died picking up bodies. The dead wagons operated uh, continuously throughout the city, and corpses were occasionally thrown into the Mississippi River, probably buried on sandbars along the river, and probably uh, buried on private property. Holst, who was the undertaker, would leave coffins, rude homemade coffins, in front of the doors of the afflicted. Um, they would leave them there one night, pick them up, fill the next day. Um, often there were not even people to go in and minister to the sick uh, for several days, and they would find the bodies in various states of decomposition. The effort was to get the bodies buried as quickly and as efficiently as they could. This area that you see in front of us with very few markers and monuments is no man's land. And here, thousands of people were buried during the yellow fever. Uh, they were brought out here. There were um, grave diggers were in short supply. They could not bury individual graves. They uh, were buried in trenches. The situation was beyond desperate. The overburdened Citizens Relief Committee began considering firing artillery throughout a 48-hour period to disperse any contagion common sense eventually prevailed. One particularly bizarre instance involved a voodoo priestess propped up in an open casket to await her personal appointment with the fever demon. Instead, she was promptly carted off to jail on a disturbing the peace warrant from the Citizens Relief Committee. When the merciful frost finally came in October and ended the fever and the fear, Memphis was decimated. Of the 22,000 who braved the three-month-long scourge, 17,600 came down with the fever. And of this, 5,150 people died, about 4,000 white, 1,000 African American. Of the original 24 members of the Citizens Relief Committee, only four were still on duty by the middle of September the loyal Shelby County Sheriff and Mayor, either dead or dying from the fever. Many of the people who fled from the city did not come back when it was over. The citizens of Memphis met at the end of December, and they voted to um, surrender the city charter and uh, 
dispose of Memphis as an organized urban entity, which they did. The Tennessee legislature, meeting uh, the following month, January 1879, accepted the termination of the Memphis City Charter and instead uh, redesignated the area simply as a taxing district. It was the taxing district of Shelby County. And from then until in the 1890s, there was no legal city of Memphis. The Tennessee General Assembly appointed a board composed of some of the leading uh, financial investors and property owners in the city. And this, uh, this taxing district board really functioned in lieu of uh, city government and did it, as a rule, quite honestly. There was no precedent as far as state government in Tennessee was concerned. And if uh, any existed in another state, I'm unaware of it. This was something new for the state government to have to step in when a city collapsed. And as for how it worked, I would say most successfully. After 1879, the yellow fever outbreaks stopped. Work had begun to thoroughly clean up Memphis. To that end, a previously untapped resource was soon discovered, an aquifer under the city. With this vast fresh water supply as a basis for a new sewage system, household cisterns, water barrels, and privies were eliminated as the utility grid was constructed. Without even realizing it, the city planners had eradicated the breeding grounds for Aedes aegypti. The city once again thrived. With a skyline now defined by the world-famous Pyramid Arena, Memphis today boasts a population of around 800,000 and has retained its status as a major commercial hub, headquarters for FedEx and international paper. At the center of a large medical community is St. Jude's, one of the nation's top hospitals for treating sick children. And who can overlook Memphis's rich musical traditions, which helped spawn no less a person than the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. And this town still loves a good party. The cotton carnivals of the past, celebrating the harvest of the first bale of king cotton, have evolved into Memphis in May, a month-long celebration centered around the barbecue contest annually held in Tom Lee Park. No longer do pigs have run of downtown streets. They're the main course. Now a more open, more dynamic town. The changes wrought since 1878 may have created an entirely new city in place of the old, but Memphis's memory isn't always so short. Martyrs Park, a nearly forgotten patch of hillside dedicated in 1971 to the courage of those citizens who stayed behind to help has recently undergone renovation as a link in a riverside walkway which will eventually extend along the top of the bluff. This beautiful view of the Mississippi River may finally give the city its repose with the sometimes unforgiving environment which helped spawn it, a sense of tranquility which it was always too busy to enjoy.